I don't see. Okay. So then I realized that it will be apt to go through how this development in science and technology helped us moving from a primitive vaccines to the current day vaccines. So in next 15 minutes, I'll run through this partly as an exemplary examples and partly as what science and technology has contributed. So, I mean, if you look at it, Jainar, everybody knows, is a father of vaccination, but if you look at how he developed it, so he made observations, analyzed those observations, created a hypothesis, tested that hypothesis in the most inexpensive way, and after interpreting results, he made conclusion and provided it to the world, first smallpox vaccine. But if you look at history of vaccines, we were pioneers. India was a pioneer and uh, it goes back, I mean, there must be beyond this, but this is a written evidence that during the Maurya Empire, uh, we were using low dose of poisons to create immunity against significant amount of poisons. And it was done for a key persons as well as waste conditions. Then uh, there's a written evidence that 7th century Buddhist monks used to take snake venom to prevent snake poisoning. And variolation, as it was known at that point in time, for smallpox also originated in India and translated to the, all the world. The only difference uh, what China did was they started putting it through the nose while we were doing over the forearm. With that, Edward Jenner comes in picture. He is a medical practitioner taught by good doctors of his time, good schools, and he starts practice in a small town. And he has also learned variolation, which was practiced for prevention of smallpox, but it was human to human. He realized that cowpox, and that he realized through his villagers, who are illiterate, that those who get a cowpox does not get a smallpox. So he started documenting it, and the first document was 13 individuals, next document was 25 individuals. And these individuals, when he tried to put variolation, they did not show any amount of infection. So he realized that, okay, there's something really good. And uh, then subsequently, unlike the current time, he started distributing these seeds free of cost around the world. Whosoever requested, he got it, okay? And uh, then uh, a one community in England did a, I mean, did a massive work, they inoculated 300 patients, subjects, a healthy volunteer, but then they challenged them also, and none of them got a vaccine. So it got a, I mean, more significant uh, uh, credibility. So, and during that time frame, vaccine seed was transferred from human to human, arm to arm. And it was very difficult to get that continuously. And uh, with each passage, there was a potency loss, so next thing which came was uh, cow lymph, so, which is also known as a reverse retrovaccination. So cow to human uh, and to cow back. Okay? So that was uh, regained the potency and more important than that, it reduced the risk of transmission from human to human. Because by that time, people started knowing that uh, when you do this, some of them get syphilis and tuberculosis, which were dreaded diseases at that point in time. But still, it was dependent on human seed material. Uh, there was no way that you can store it and keep it. Then came uh, another gentleman, and he says, OK, why human, cow, human? Why can't we have cow to cow? And that was, again, a significant. And then subsequently, the lymph was replaced by the skin. By the time people started knowing that you can grow the smallpox in the skin, I mean, they call called smallpox or a cowpox. Uh, and then subsequently, it was replaced by other animals. So in India, at that point in time, it was a water buffalo mainly. And uh, then early transfer was, uh, in Indian sitting, it was through threads, it was through beads, it was through various things which we can't think of today. But that's how it was transferred from one place to the other place. Then came, uh, as it moved forward, you have to have a stable formulation. So the first thing which happened was glycerin was known. And it was known that glycerin is a protectant. Uh, so 40 to 60 percent glycerin was used, so discovery was glycerin took place in 83 and food preservation 1800, but it took 90 more years for getting into the vaccine. Uh, then came freeze dried, again freeze dried was known in 13th century. Then histological sections, 
were preserved using that in 1890. Then vacuum chamber was created using electricity and that became something with which quickly freeze dry vaccine came into the home. Then uh, still they were not going beyond few weeks or few months and then there came addition of phenol, sorry. Uh, phenol and phenol if you know, I mean the, it was discovered in 1834, reduced smell of Persian sewage in 60, Lister used as an antiseptic in 67 and then 1908 started using in the rabies. Why I am saying is, it will give you an idea that during those period, transmission of knowledge from one place to other place was not easy and it took a significant time for translation of science to technology to knowledge. And there was no quality control till 1927. And then uh, UK started it and then spread all over it. And then if you look at a quality control parameter, purity of vaccine was decided by what is the bacterial count. It has to be less than particular amount. Potency was you use a guinea pig or a skin or a rabbit cornea and inoculate. And if they develop vaccine disease, you are a potent. Okay? So vaccine can pass through. Then came WHO. And WHO also at that point, still the vaccine was not said, they only define what is the bacterial count. And potency by pock forming units on the culture. And then uh, heat stability was added to it and then it has to be heat stable for 37 degrees because it has to go to the develop world, developing world. And because of all this, smallpox got eradicated. But if you look at it, all the vaccines, subsequently DNA sequencing, they identify what were the strains so all the people use different strains, but as luck would have it, every strain worked, and so we are survived. So then came a Cox postulate that a disease is always caused by organism, and how do you evaluate and point out that this is the organism responsible for that. And then I'm just taking you through what happened over a time. So if you look at it, Uh, so the first was a smallpox. It was purely based on some individual effort, investigated initial study, and without much of a uh, problem, it went into all over the world. But then there was a germ theory, and before that, nobody believed that bacteria or virus are there. Attenuation Pasteur did that by passaging, sequential passaging, you can attenuate, and then you can use it to create a vaccine, and then heat activation. And with that, we get four vaccines, and then subsequently, formalin inactivation came. Then first human virus was isolated. Till that, everybody was thinking that there is something beyond bacteria, but nobody knew what it is. So they used to call it filtrable organism. Okay? And uh, then uh, invention of polysaccharide as an antigen, and then conjugation with the protein, and uh, then cell culture of a virus, because till that point, it was animal tissue which was used to culture the virus, mainly brain nervous tissue. And uh, then came uh, that you can create recombinant protein. And with that, number of vaccines getting uh, developed, produced, and approved got increasing. So I mean, I'll just give you run through two stories. Uh, so one is Hafkin. Why I like this is for two reasons. One is, though he was a Russian, he worked in India and developed two vaccines in India, which became good. And he went through all the crises in life. So. I mean, before he came, I mean, uh, he was basically a prodigy of Mackinco, who won the Nobel Prize, and he moved to Paris as a librarian. Can you think a researcher joining as a librarian in institute? So he joined as a librarian, but the task he did was improve vaccine, cholera vaccine, which was invented by Pasteur for a chicken. He brought it to some level, and then he tested every time he tested on his own. So he was so confident that whatever he did will work, and he will not get disease. But nobody believed in him. So he thought, what is the best way? So that's how he came to India. And he started in a small lab. And uh, by that time, there was hap cholera hap epidemic happening. So first field trial. And this is the first field trial ever done for any vaccine. And uh, it was done in Kolkata, following the first was done in um, army and then Calcutta and then uh, if you look at it, he did very well. Who, control group was there and he followed them rigorously and he got these numbers that 
if you use a vaccine, you can make significant impact on the disease outcome. And uh, though it was done in India, used in India, around the world nobody believed, but the Russian got hit in 1998. So they came back to India to learn from Hafkin and went back and used the vaccine all throughout the empire. So this is something which is unbelievable if you look from that time perspective. So the next thing was a plague. While he was working on a cholera vaccine, plague became big in India. It came from Hong Kong. So he was now, rather than scientist, he was asked by government to join the Indian Civil Service, what we used to call ICS. So he became part of an ICS team and uh, he embarked on development and then what was he given? I mean, if you think in those terms, makes you laboratory in Grand Medical College corridor. Okay? And three assistants. And all the three assistants disappear. Still, within three months, he developed inactivated plague vaccine and he inactivated bus by temperature at 60 degree. Isolated organism, heated it 60 degree and he showed that it induces and again he did it first on himself and then prisoners like uh, I mean Hillman, if you look at a Hillman story, everything he did was first in the prisoners. He came a little later but half came with the use of the government machinery, he could do it in the prisoners who volunteer. That's what is written. And uh, then, uh, I mean, as it happens, I mean, you can get a surprises. So six people die on the first day, three in both the groups. But subsequently, I mean, uh, hardly anybody died in the vaccine group, while control group had a six death. Okay. So this was deemed to be successful and rolled out. With a small study like this, it was rolled out. and. Within weeks, 11,000 people got it in India. And by the end of 20th century, or beginning of century, 5 billion only in India were inoculated. And he got highest award. And he was recognized for his work. And he was promoted as a director of plate, which is currently Hafkin Institute. And Joseph Lister, who is the father of antiseptics, also gave him a name of savior of humanity. But all that glitters is not gold. So using his vaccine in 1902, 19 people died of tetanus okay, in Punjab, in India. And when they found out, it was contaminated vaccine. So it got a backlash. He was suspended. But subsequently, they said it is not his fault. He is not responsible for manufacturing. And he passed through all the tests which was there. So he was reappointed. So he got us two vaccines, but more important the vaccine is how to evaluate a vaccine in a controlled clinical trial. So this was the first person who did it. So that's the reason I'm putting this. And then it also tells you that why we need a stringent quality control criteria. So uh, there is a polio vaccine. It is again fascinating. I mean, if you look at it, 1908, polio virus was identified by only filtration and injecting filtration filtrate to the monkeys who develop polio. So it fulfilled Cox postulate. Okay. Then subsequently somebody said it's not one virus, there are three types. And he did it by simple experiments on monkeys. Then challenge was how to grow it. So somebody started growing it in animals and then translated to embryonic brain. And during that time frame, polio was epidemic and Harry Truman, who became a president, himself has suffered from polio. So he decided to create a trust and promote the research related to polio. And John Salk, who is considered father for polio, he was appointed as the first director of Vaccine Research Laboratory. And then the three virus subtypes were isolated. Then came cell culture, the big change came, you could cell culture them. And with the cell culture, it opened up the field for all viral vaccines. And uh, though Hillary was the first to evaluate OPV, it did not go well because of various problem. One of was, uh, it was grown in the mice, and then uh, it was also, it had a lot of side effects. And uh, as Hafkin, he also believed in his vaccine, so he inoculated not only himself, but his family member first, and subsequently rolled out. And this is 
one of the large trial which had a dual control and there was a lot of debate around it what side of the study should be so they had a dual control not used anything then use placebo and uh, then you have a vaccine arm and if you look at the number 4 lakh 20 thousand received vaccine 2 lakh placebo and 1.2 million were classic without anything and when it was decoded its efficacy was 90 percent and it became a history it was immediately approved but all his work was funded by Franklin Roosevelt's trust and that is a value that NGOs can add which unfortunately we don't have in India to that extent so while this became there were a group of people who still believe in live vaccine based on the work done by previous vaccines so they pursued it and one of them was uh, Sabin and uh, Sabin in spite of proving that his vaccine is working he could not get a funds he could not get a supporter he could not do trials in US or a developed world so he moved to US and this is the largest single arm study done ever more than 10 million Soviet children were given this vaccine it was a single arm study no control no placebo and at the end US also approved it now there was a debate what happens when you have a live attenuated vaccine versus in killed vaccine or inactivated vaccine so OPV had several advantages faster immune response because that's the key during epidemic and uh, they will always secrete some amount of virus into the stool and you can create a herd immunity by a different way but that can be I mean double-edged sword and because it's oral you can sugar coat it and make it easily palatable for the children but the greatest advantage which IPV offered at that point and even today is there is no because it's inactive there's no reversion and transmission of the virus and once you have controlled the epidemic you have it so smallpox and polio polio we have irrigated from India smallpox irrigated from all over the world that's the reason I chose them and they are interesting stories for vaccine history I have deliberately not taken Hillman because he was all spread out and he had a lot of support well this two all these stories did not have significant support then I mean everybody believes that I mean the science is so good you have a killed vaccine you have a live attenuated vaccine why we don't have all the vaccines like this so for a live vaccine I give all vaccine candidates do not translate into adequate immunity and safety and I'll just give an example what happens when you inactivate so there are two examples so formalin inactivated RSV vaccine it failed to provide any immunity in a large clinical trial on the top of it they got advanced disease enhanced disease antibody enhanced disease and that was disease rate was 80 percent versus five percent so who will buy this vaccine or who will approve this vaccine <laughs> okay and probably it was because of th2 immune response generated and lack of antibody affinity which we know now but it, at that point in time nobody knew it okay so then uh, antibodies produced were not against the neutralizing antibody but against the different epitopes then the other example is measles vaccine which was actually licensed okay this was not licensed pre licensed trial this was licensed in 1863 but immunity disappeared very quickly and if you look at regulatory requirements were different and it was licensed and not only that it disappeared quickly but it made them vulnerable after the immunity disappear and so you get more disease than when you are not vaccinated so same reasons no T cell immunity but the reason given now is probably carbonyl group introduced by formalin yeah. 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 that's okay uh, so tip the balance between protection to the adverse effects and that means inactivation does not necessarily mean a good vaccine okay so then we come to latest which is a covid and covid opened up pandora's box it allowed us i mean i have forgotten to put dna vaccine but provide us a platform which were approved for the first time so mrna vaccines adenoviral vector vaccines they were not existing before and then dna covid vaccine so this new platform came very rapidly because of the covid everybody geared up the time which was 10 to 20 to 30 years 
was quenched to less than 10 months. And uh, then, I mean, uh, if you have heard them, when the Pfizer guy who was responsible for development of a vaccine on all the front overall serve, what will you do if the, uh, another epidemic comes? And the answer she gave was, I will eliminate the animal testing. I will not do talks, I will not do safety study, I will not do efficacy study, you know, I will just go straight to the humans and will deliver vaccine in four months. Okay, so that's the changes which are likely to happen. And just to sum up, uh, some of the people who have contributed to the development of science and technology of vaccine, they have received the Nobel Prize at various time frames. And with this, I'll thank you and end my talk. Thank you very much.